Um, John, you have some housekeeping items. Yes, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm John Williams, the executive director of your organization. And um, I'll just uh, share my screen for a second so you can see what our agenda is for tonight. Think, can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. So we've got um, uh, a few introductions here and words of welcome. And then uh, we'll have uh, Mark Canella at 7.05. And then just before eight, we'll have uh, Perry Wilson from uh, FCC. Uh, and as far as uh, other uh, housekeeping goes, uh, please keep your microphones on mute. Uh, during the, uh, the sessions, of course, uh, if you need to ask a question at the end, you're, you're welcome to uh, take that off. And you can also use the chat uh, to type questions uh, as we go for our presenters. And uh, it would probably help you too if you kept your video off, particularly if you have uh, limited bandwidth uh, in your, uh, your internet. And uh, that's about it. I'll throw it over to uh, Randall again. Well, my uh, introduction, and again, I say welcome. My name's Randall Goodfellow. I'm chair of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee and uh, worked with John to put the two evenings together here. The last evening we had uh, speakers as part of our virtual information day, as well as an announcement from the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fair, the parliamentary secretary of that person, for the, our minister. And um, we had some great presentations. I'd like now just to hand it over to Frank uh, to uh, say a few words before we get directly into our speakers <clears throat> for this evening. Frank? Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Randall. And uh, Mark, pleasure to see you here uh, today. You know, I'm uh, waiting for your words of wisdom here for Ontario. And um, I would just like to say, I, just looking quickly through the uh, group, um, I see a number of people that were not on last night. Um, so I'm not sure, Randall, should I read what I did last night or just skip through it or what's the, what's your, give me your, uh, your insight here. Well, I did just a few words there related okay, to all right, I'll do that. our good hard yeah, work, go, that type of thing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> anyways, uh, for the ones that weren't on last night, but again, welcome to our uh, uh, second annual uh, virtual info days and uh, it was quite success last year and we had a, a good crowd on last night with some really really good subject especially on the climate change was uh, was uh, was very good i've been 13 months into my presidency there now um i've done a number of changes at the executive level and uh, to strengthen uh, to strengthen up the executive uh, one of the big moves we've done and i'm not sure if steve needham is on tonight but uh, steve has uh, moved into a new position uh, head of a new committee calling calling it boiling it down with steve needham and Steve's committee members will be holding a chat group on Facebook. And this group is specially designed to answer for all the new and small producers that are coming aboard. If uh, anybody has looked at the other Facebook groups that are out there, maybe a little guidance will come in handy this year with, with Steve and his group. He has a forest three specialist on his group and a number of good maple syrup producers and uh, industry uh, uh, minded people. So good luck, Steve, on, on that. And the other thing was the uh, buddy, buddy staff research is coming along fine. Um, they're around uh, $8,900 out of the $10,000 goal. Uh, in case you didn't hear me last night, uh, we're looking for another $1,100 to reach that $10,000 goal. So donations uh, would be accepted. Um, they can be in my name if they want to be and I'll pass it on. Just kidding, just kidding. Anyways, um, the other thing moving along quickly is all the hard work that's being done by the 10 working groups. Um, the data group met today. Uh, they're in their final sessions uh, with recommendations coming forth and then moving into phase two. Uh, the other nine are either coming near the end or just starting. And Randall uh, Goodfellow, who is the head of the governance committee is uh, proceeding well and moving the project through uh, with his firm guidance uh, all the ways. And the last thing was, and I see Cheryl White is on tonight, she was the winner of the $500 PV Mark card. In case any of you were still waiting for that announcement, sorry, Jim and Cheryl Whiteman, the brother and sister team of Lancaster has won that. And again, that's all I have to say. Randall, over to you. 
thank you very much for the time. Enjoy the evening. Thank you, Frank. Um, let us uh, talk about this evening. Uh, John showed us the uh, the agenda, and we we have two speakers. And uh, these two speakers, and I'll introduce them each in their uh, turn, uh, were folks that you asked us to find to talk about some subjects that are quite important to us. Uh, particularly the, on the first one, it was uh, younger producers saying, I want to expand, but the cost of land is um, steep. And uh, it's not like what it used to be. We have more people in the rural areas. The land cost is going up. How do I expand my operation? So we've invited uh, Mark Canella, who is an associate professor and farm business management specialist with the University of Vermont. Uh, he currently directs uh, University of Vermont's Extension Agricultural Pro Business Programs with the focus on uh, delivery of management uh, skills uh, for the for, uh, farm and the forest business areas. It does a lot of work on financial analysis and also uh, a lot of deep work on business research. And he's going to talk about the, this evening the work he's done on you know, new forms of uh, relationships uh, between uh, maple syrup producers and other people, and um, he works on a lot of uh, a lot of uh, activities related to economic development ec and cost production studies. And uh, Mark, I was telling you we have a cost production study that's uh, going to be released momentarily. Uh, Mark, at the moment, is actually on a sabbatical from from that job, and he's been helping communities in different areas with with different challenges in their agricultural businesses. Um, I believe on a volunteer basis, particularly when you went and helped some folks in Puerto Rico with coffee. Anyways, without any further ado, I, I'd like to introduce Mark Canella to the uh, folks this evening. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, great. Thanks, Randall. Um, thanks, John, for organizing, Frank, and thanks everyone. Looks like great, great attendance tonight. So. I'm very pleased to, to be with you. Um, I, I can't say that when I started my sabbatical semester, I thought, geez, I can't wait to have a virtual meeting with folks from Ontario, but sitting in my home office in Montpelier. Um, but this this will have to do for now. But uh, love to get up and see some of you and meet you in person. I'm going to switch over to a screen share and um, get a presentation started in a moment. And, you know, either Randall or John, just double check to make sure that that's visible and you can hear me okay. Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, as Randall said, um, I've been doing a variety of work with maple producers and this presentation really will focus on our more recent work on business relationships, uh, legal resources, legal templates. Um, and I would say just the conversation of business to business relationships um, that we've been trying to advance with our program over the past, um, I guess, year and a half, we've been working on this Get set up. Um, before I do talk, uh, Randall gave a nice introduction, give you a little bit more detail. I've been doing my work of farm business planning, generally a lot of kitchen table work, we'd say, sometimes sitting on five gallon buckets in the barn and, and working with managers. Uh, I've been doing this work for almost 15 years. I started more recently in about 2013-14 working with maple producers specifically, um, and that's when we launched our benchmark program doing cost of production work, intense financial analysis, detailed financial analysis with only 15, 20 producers a year, but really giving us super insight into the, to the finances. Uh, for sake of background, uh, there was a point in my life when I was able to run about 600, 700 taps working for an educational farm. Uh, currently, I push out about six or seven buckets a year with my uh, with my middle school girls, and uh, we deliver sap over to our neighbor's sugar house for uh, a quite a formalized barter and trade that we keep track of on a clipboard. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm going to run for about 25, 30 minutes. Uh, feel free to type questions into the chat. I'll try to check it if I can manage the screens. If not, um, we'll hopefully have some time at the end. And uh, any of the facilitators here, if something comes up in the chat that I don't catch right away and you feel motivated, don't hesitate to interrupt me. And I think a lot of that learning can happen from conversation, especially from people sharing what's going on. 
So we'll talk today about business to business relationships, some of the work we've been doing. Um, I'm going to give you a little background on uh, some tap rental activity that we tracked through the Northeast in recent survey work, uh, an overview of leases, uh, the least recent legal templates that we've developed at UVM, and certainly give you some access to see those documents on your own so you can take them to, to apply them to your situation. And then a little bit in general on joint ventures, contracts, and legal entities as well. Um, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I've, we've been compelled to do this work um, in order to advance this conversation of business to business relationships. So the one thing I'll say is, as I talk about the legal side of this, uh, I'm not really here to tell you that you should have all this formalized, but I'll say that there's a reason some people may want things formalized legally. Um, and in general, in this process and in conversation with some of our reviewers, um, we found that the legal agreements become a nice launching point for what to talk about with other business owners if you're having the desire to explore a relationship. And you may never hire a lawyer and you may never codify it in a legal document. Um, and I'm not going to shake my finger at that. But what we want to emphasize is there's a lot of things to talk about when you enter into relationships. And it's good to talk about them uh, beforehand, uh, before you engage in the relationship. And certainly um, before something may go wrong. And it doesn't take a legal agreement to have, to, to have that advanced planning and good communication. Uh, and we, we think that these, these resources that I'll sh start sharing with you can do that. Uh, this is the website where we're parking all our information most recently. And I'm gonna put that in the chat box as well. You can check it out tonight as we go or afterwards, uh, www.maplemanager. Dot org. We've got a little bit of a screen door, we call it ahead of time. Uh, when, you, when you join the site, we do ask for an email and a little bit about your business so that we can certainly keep track of who we're reaching. And it gives us a good uh, mechanism to do evaluations, which is the business I'm in evaluating to see if these programs are working and, um, and understand who we're reaching. So anytime I, if I reference this website, that's, that's where the information is parked and you're welcome to it at no cost. Um, you know, so business to business relationships, why might you be thinking about it? Uh, I think I'm going to balance this comp, this concept of limitations and opportunities. I think it's fair to say that any of you in your operations, um, you're going to face limitations, uh, physical limitations of space, um, equipment, and then management limitations of what you can handle yourself, whether it's a skill set or it's the number of hours in the day. Um, and the idea of the business to business relationship is really just opening the door um, and opening, opening the vision of people to realize that you don't have to settle for the limitations of your property or the limitations of what you're good at. There could be opportunities to, um, to do different things by coordinating and partnering. Uh, a couple examples here, um, you know, the opportunity to specialize in one thing, if, if you'd like to take a particular aspect of the maple supply chain from not even tapping and collecting sap, but the forestry side of the things that happened before that, all the way to the final delivery of a finished product. There's a lot of different things in there. And there may be an opportunity for you to, to focus on one of those things, which will require you to have a connection point kind of up and down the chain. The ability to share resources, um, that can be nice. Uh, the concept of scaling back or scaling up, uh, you may need to access new resources if you wanna scale up and take your business. To, to the next level. Uh, in some cases, taking your business to the next level may actually be scaling backwards and having a smaller business, but that may offer you the time to say, um, get more detailed in your marketing plan or get more involved in your marketing strategy. So possibly scaling back production to focus on marketing and branding could bring you down towards a different opportunity, but you're gonna need maybe someone to backfill and to get you that sap or syrup to, to move your brand forward. Um, the concept of collaboration to, to spread risk uh, is certainly available. The idea of running your business based on what you can muster with your individual one or two people on your property is a great venture and it's certainly a passionate thing. Um, it can be vulnerable if someone has any interruption individually with an illness or even a, a big storm. So the idea of having different partners around could, could, could offer some risk reduction. And then capital, and I believe that Randall mentioned this right at the beginning, um, 
some people don't have enough capital to go into this modern maple thing at the scale that they wish. There's a number of technologies out there that are available that co cost quite a bit to get to get into and to, to get started with. However, there are a number of people in our communities that may know nothing about maple syrup, but could potentially have quite a, a, a lot of capital maybe at their disposal. And so the idea of partnering with businesses or individuals to access capital is definitely on our list of opportunities. I'm going to I'm going to read a couple scenarios out of people I've run across and I'd love for you in the audience tonight to you know nod your head or think to yourself if this is you I've maxed out my tap potential on my land but my neighbors have some forest available some maple forest available is this you I have the skills to sugar. I have the, the skills to, to, to manage a maple enterprise, but I'm not in a position to borrow all the money needed to start up a commercial scale enterprise. Is this any of you? And, and I'll emphasize commercial scale enterprise. The idea of adopting the technologies and setting up at the scale to potentially create a part or full-time job is, is a different thing than starting up an enterprise because you love it but it stays in this kind of hobby, part-time enterprise mode, different, different dynamics there. One more, I just like to focus on this one particular aspect of Maple. Some of you may resonate with this one. I'm gonna pause there for a second and I'd love you all, if you got a piece of pen or paper, just to, I'm gonna stop for 30 seconds. And I'd like you to think about either a constraint that you have or your business has some some sort of limitation and um and you can flip it perhaps some of you may see an opportunity with a parcel nearby take a time to write this down and if you're willing to put it in the chat box i won't read them off but i think other people would be glad to check it out and just hear maybe what the different opportunities or the limitations are and to get people thinking about this thing that i face for my own business maybe there's a way to overcome it or to access the opportunity by um, by relating to some other other businesses. So take a second, a limitation that you face or your business faces that could be overcome by partnering with someone or just a straight up opportunity, something that's out there that you think if with the right relationships, you may be able to, to tackle it. All right, good. We got a couple more popping up here and feel free to check it out. I'll keep going. And uh, and thanks for sharing for folks to do. It's always great to get an inside scoop with businesses, what, what they're thinking about. Okay, access to woods. Let's talk a little bit about rental taps. We, we really were um, interested to do the survey two, three years ago now. Uh, in the Northeastern US, we did a survey to Northeast maple producers, had over 300 people responding. And overall, we had about 1.2 million total taps covered in the survey. And we asked people questions over, well, one survey and asked them questions about two consecutive years. Of the 300 plus participants in the survey, 42% of them were renting taps. 42% of them were either accessing taps from rental and didn't own any, or they owned property, but they were a, a renting additional taps to, to add to their potential to, to produce syrup. This figure, the pie, pie chart on the bottom right here that you're looking at um, shows the actual tap ownership. And it shows that in this survey, 61% of the taps were on owned land, the owned operator. 39%, almost 40% of the taps in this 1.2 million tap survey were leased out. I think that's a significant, significant number of taps out there indicating that there's an industry here that at least in the Northeast US is really, um, it's based on the fact that there are relationships. There are sugar makers out there that are active and they're partnering with landowners that have maple woods um, and the sugar makers don't own it all. And that comes with some opportunity and also comes with some, you know, some causes, some concepts and some topics to, uh, I wouldn't say concerns, but some things to attend to in these relationships. 
So who rents the taps? We found that everyone rented taps at all scales. Everyone from, I don't own any, and I rent 200. But the one theme that came out in the survey, 70% of the producers that owned more than 5,000 taps were also renting additional taps. So I'll say that again, seven out of 10 of the producers that were scaled, to, where they owned 5,000 taps of their own, seven out of 10 of them were renting additional taps. They, they, they sought to get at a higher level. Um, based on rental. Looking into the economics, we found that the larger tap enterprises were significantly more economically viable. Um, looking at this chart here, this is these numbers aren't gonna add up to 100%. What we've done is compiled a few different questions. We asked individuals in this survey if they were, if they would describe themselves as economically viable, which could be easily, I'd say, defined as profitability and the ability to pay themselves um, either a livable wage or a working wage for their time they spent in the enterprise. Uh, we also gave them a couple opportunities to say they were sustainable, meaning they're doing okay, but they're relying on off farm income, off maple income, or they're doing okay, but they're leaning back on some equity or savings, maybe a retirement or something else to keep going. They're not covering everything from maple. And then some people also identified as vulnerable, meaning they're not covering their costs and they've got no backup plan. So when we look at those from a scaling basis, all of those 312 responses, only about 22% of the whole survey group said they were indeed economically viable, covering their costs and paying the owners an equivalent wage for their time or paying family members, um, not just tapping family members for volunteer work, but actually the capacity to pay. Only 20%, 22%. When we move up to 5,000 taps, we see that economic viability, 60% of the over 5,000 TAP enterprises said that they were economically viable. So that's a big jump in profitability based on scale. And now going back to you all, how many of you people are blessed to have 5,000 acre or 5,000 TAPs owned outright? Some of you maybe, but for the majority of people, especially getting into it, you maybe aren't starting there, which leads us back to this question of if I do, if I do wish to go into a commercial enterprise where I need to pay myself something, how am I going to get there? I'm going to need to have a relationship with another landowner. I'm going to need to find a way to access more sap or more syrup to move this business to a scale where things start to, to click in. I don't speak in absolutes. I don't tell everyone they always have to grow. You know, you don't have to get big to get to, it's not big to get better, but these are numbers that we're seeing. These are trends that we're observing of operators in the industry and, and how they report their viability. Okay, a couple of things about site factors. I, I'm not a forester, I'm an economist, um, but in the concept of rental uh, rentals or lease, I think it's just fair to say uh, the appeal of the property is gonna be based on factors and then potentially the cost of the rental rate could also be based on certain factors. So what are they? Um, we got location. Um, location could be quality of woods. It also could be um, access to road. Um, this does, this could mean anything, north facing slope, south facing slope, um, a number of things, uh, distance to maybe your home base, distance to your own sugar house, distance to your own house, um, quality of roads, things like that. Then getting into the forestry side of things, um, total tap count in a particular parcel, if you're going to look at that or possibly expansion with a landowner, perhaps you have options to get into what you want to get into now, but that property may actually offer more taps in the future. Um, taps per acre, what we're seeing uh, with our work, we generally would say that 55 to 60 tap per acre is a number that um, would be about the average. We've seen some higher tap numbers and some lower tap numbers. And granted, I'm not in Ontario, um, but that's a number we usually use as an estimate, 55. And then average tree size. Uh, I, I mentioned that I'm not a forester. Right now, Mark Iselhart and our team with the Proctor Research Center is doing a little bit more work to try to explore that nuance of the number of taps on the land in conjunction with the size of the trees to get a sense of, it's not just the tap count, but it's really the volume of sap that we're after. And they're gonna try to document in the next several months, maybe a calculator or two that can help people um, do some of that evaluation. Um, to really get optimal production from the woods. And in this case, to select the right, you know, the right woods. Um, 
So I'm going to stop very quick overview there, but I do want to refer people back to the website. We, we did a webinar last year um, on sugar bush appraisal, which talks about the different factors from an ownership standpoint, but those factors are very relevant if you're looking to lease in the sense of looking for the, the features that are going to provide the value that you want. We've got that there, and, and I believe we also have a Sugar Woods uh, assessment sheet that we've adapted from Cornell University that lists about well, two pages worth of these factors, the things that um, a maple producer would consider if they were stepping on someone else's property and going through the checklist of what are they looking for and, and what's the what are the features in the property that are going to, I'd say, be make or break their interest in, in having it. Okay, so rentals are happening. We're, we're, we're clear about that. Some of the larger producers, it seems like, are intentionally opting for rental to expand their enterprises and their profiting. Let's talk a little bit about the rates uh, and first why they matter. I think, first of all, for certainly cash payments, especially if you're the producer renting, you're going to need a, a, an idea of how much you're going to be paying and how much cash is coming out of pocket to access those additional taps. If you're a landowner, uh, the rental rates certainly matter uh, from a comparative to timber, timber sales, or other uses, recreational or other uses of the property that could be uh, generating revenue. So the, the relationship of the rate on Maple compared to what else you might get otherwise. Um, that next bullet, valuation of in-kind trades. We know there's a lot of informal trading that goes on in the community. Uh, a lot of great people that are contractors and have different skills or different equipment. Um, the idea of exchanging taps for maybe a portion of the CERB crop. The rental rate becomes the proxy where you can start to put values on things. Um, barter, barter is a unique thing. It's great to barter because it sounds so flexible, but then suddenly someone's still got to do the math and figure out how much you got to barter. Um, so the rental rate can serve a purpose there. Uh, we're going to have a, a more detailed presentation later on transition and succession planning, which is terrific. I'll just note that rental rates can be really instrumental in planning um, succession planning within a family. The, the idea of transferring the business or transferring management stages over time, implementing rental rates can really provide some, what I like to say is some guardrails on that relationship within a family, which can be helpful for, for quantifying the value of ownership and, and, and the ability for people to pay again. So rental rates can, can matter for a lot of reasons. Let's take a look at the numbers we got in our survey. Uh, looking at the bottom two pies on the, on the bottom right, we've got orange and the, and the bottom left, we've got gray. Uh, I'll start with the gray one. Over 40, 40%, 43% of the taps in that survey that were rented were rented for a dollar to a dollar 24, and that'd be US dollars. Um, that was the largest chunk. And then the second largest, not too far behind at 37% of those taps was 50 cents to 99 cents. Um, we do hear about higher tap rates in our competitive regions. Um, really difficult to know what's if it's speculation, people are prospecting to secure taps uh, in those competitive regions, and that those are the ones we hear that are approaching two dollars a tap. Um, and then we certainly still hear reports of free taps. Uh, I'm not sure the dynamic in Ontario, in Vermont, we do have a what we call a current use program. Uh, it's a tax abatement program for forestry uses as well as agricultural uses. And in some cases, the landowners recognize well. Landowners recognize a major tax benefit by keeping their land in that agricultural or maple determination. And in some cases, I think it's very likely that we'll find landowners that'll find enough value in the tax reduction that the, the actual cash rate on the, on the maple tap may not be as significant for them as the tax savings that they're gonna generate. All right, I'm going to do a couple more in rental rates and I'll just take a look in the chat box and see if there's any questions that I can address before I keep going. Um, something comes up with rental rates a lot. Um, I won't say a lot, but occasionally, let's say it comes up, people will say rental rates are great, but our maple market is changing all the time and crops are going up and down. It's a, it's a, a volatile crop, no doubt. We have strong years and unfortunately this past year we, we've had thin production years. Um, so people do ask about the idea of adjustable rental rates. Um, I think in concept, it makes a lot of sense. It may be a little complicated, but in concept, the idea of um, sharing the profits, if there's maybe a bumper crop or if the market were to spike, is a reasonable consideration between the sugar maker and the landowner. 
in the sense that it's really a, a joint a joint venture in a way, or at least a joint kind of collective collective venture in the idea of it. And the idea of spreading risk as well, say that there's a poor crop or the market tanks in a, in a short period of time. Uh, the idea of spreading that risk maybe between both parties is, is feasible. What we've did, done in the past uh, couple of years, I've looked at rental rates and looked at bulk prices for syrup and tried to look at the different factors of the amount of production yield coming off of woods and the market rate at the time and the prevailing rental rates. And I've come to, I'd say, a, a kind of a general conclusion that we're looking at around 10 to 12 percent of the revenue that comes from a tap could be uh, you know accounted for in the rental rate and that gets us to about our one dollar rate so our one dollar per tap rental rate so this percentage of revenue is the concept of getting a sense of how much production in syrup equivalent comes out of that tap and then applying the market price of bulk syrup and then we sort of see like hey so 10% of the value of that syrup could be applied in a rental rate. And just to give you that $1 per tap, I got my sheet here to check it um, at 12%. If we were at a $2.40 in the US, $2.40 per pound market rate for syrup, if I applied the 12% rental rate kind of milestone, um, we'd have a dollar a tap. So $2.40 a pound market rate for syrup, um, $1 a tap, and that's an average yield. So that's 0.35 gallons. I haven't been able to adjust everything into liters. So make a note, 0.35 gallons, that's about our average yield in Vermont. Some of the stronger, higher, stronger producers are producing more than that, almost a half a gallon a tap. But that's kind of where that ratio comes from. Under average yield conditions and a market around 240 a pound, 10 to 12%. And that rate will fluctuate. So that, that rate is something you can carry forward. If you say 10% and then the market price changes, your, your rental rate would adjust. So that's an idea for some of you, those that are out there. Again, to the transfer and transition piece, I'll just, I want to tip my hat to that. And the situation of a family member, like a parent bringing in a younger generation and using a rental rate as a way to bring them into kind of financial management or ownership kind of mindset. If the market were to tank, I know a lot of parents parents, uh, you know, mothers and fathers, they would probably like to adjust the rental rate that their, that their child is paying and share some of that risk. So that's another reason to consider this kind of rate adjustment in order to share the risk. Real quickly, a couple alternative rental structures um, that we've observed. Landowner may get a certain percentage of the syrup crop could be figured out. Um, you could do your own calculations on that. Again, discounting the rates to facilitate business transfer. Um, in the situation of bringing a younger generation in, maybe reducing the rates in order to give them a chance to step in with the assumption that they'll build their experience and then move into the next level. Um, I mentioned this last one, the idea of a, a dollar rate per acre um, as a potential thing to consider if you're into forestry practices or other forest products harvested from your land, you may not wanna think about your, your, your loss of access to real estate um, in the context of taps, you may be thinking about it from an acres because you have a sense of what the forest resource, resource is worth from a, a physical space calculation. So per acre could be another factor. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do one more here and then I'll check some questions. This is the last one that I wanna do on, on rental rates. A lot of numbers here and I'll try to guide you through it. And, and what I would say is a lot of people will ask themselves, well, should I buy the land? Theoretically, if you could, or should I tap? Should I tap it out? We ran these very really simple calculations, um, and I'll walk you through them. Starting on the right hand side, I think that's easiest. Let's look at a straight rental, one dollar per tap. Pretty easy. We can handle the math even while I'm talking here. If you're renting for one dollar a tap, and you're going to try to access, what do we got here? Okay, thousand taps. Thousand taps on about 18 acres. That uses our general tap density. So $1 per tap, I'm going to rent 1,000 taps, and um, that's a $1,000 cash payment every year, $1 per tap operating expense. Simple math there. Over 10 years, you're going to be spending about $10,000 to rent that, and you're not going to have any asset because you don't own anything. So $10,000 out the door, cash payment, no ownership. The comparison here on the left is if you were to take ownership, and we did a very simple index. We used a 10-year loan at 5%. 
um, calculated the monthly payment. You can kind of skip down on the left-hand side to about halfway, and you'll see the annual per tap payment is $2.29. It's over twice as much as the $1 per tap. Um, but we need to factor in that a portion of that $2.29 is going towards ownership costs, and a portion of it is going just to the rental rate. I call it the rental on capital if you're borrowing it. So looking at the green on the bottom, you're going to see instead of being out $10,000 for rental rate and having nothing to show for it, you're going to be out $22,000 plus. However, you're going to have an asset on your balance sheet. And there's no right or wrong here. It's really kind of a situation, uh, a personal situation of where you're at. Are you looking to reduce your cash outlay or are you in a situation where you could move the, move the dollars out for ownership and then own that property on your balance sheet? These are really quick calculations to get people thinking about the fact that it can go in different ways. And I do want to express that this is none of this has been done with any uh, future discounting for capital, net present value, if any of you are accountants or financial analysts, that's really the appropriate way to take this calculation to the next level. If you're borrowing money, you need to know that when you borrow money, you're, you're giving up your opportunity to, to earn interest on, a, on that money otherwise. So that and inflation needs to be factored into this as a long-term calculation. Um, but this gets us going, gets us going on the concept. Do I rent? Do I own? I got a few more slides, but I'm going to stop and just take a, see if we've got a little bit of time. Mark, it, it, it's Randall. Can you yeah. slide that slide down? I, we don't seem to see the bottom line of it or. Okay. Yeah. I roll it up. I don't know what. Let me, um, I'm going to just change the view here. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's good. We can see it. Can you see that now? Yeah. Excellent. You had the information there. It was just at the uh, bottom of the uh, left hand. The, the word sheet was uh, cut off, and I thought maybe there was some other another line altogether. Thank okay. you very much. That's good. You got perfect. it. Yeah. No. Thanks. Thanks for speaking up. All right. One, I'm gonna... one of the questions that I saw coming up was, and and it's happening in our area, is that people will tap their bushes and then sell um, sell sap. And, um, and as well, sometimes they will have a line in their bush from when their operations were there, and then just somebody takes it over. Have you considered those types of um, calculations? Yeah, um, we've done a little. I couldn't really, I couldn't give you a detail, but the idea, and if I got this, the idea of the, the, the lines already being there, maybe existing lines. Um, well, <laughs> I think this has come up a lot, and the, the question often is, well, what's this? What, what's the status of those lines? Are they, are they in good condition? Um, I have heard from a few people that have gone into woods with existing lines, and unfortunately, they thought maybe there was a resource there, and then they realized that they really were going to be better off installing something new and being assured that it was set up really, you know, and ta tubing system installation is has innovated in the past 10 years, the, the, the line setups and the architecture. Um, so in some cases there's formulas to kind of figure out there's existing value there for sure, Randall, but more than not, I've heard people say, well, we just realized we're gonna to need to put our own lines in to make sure they're up to our standard. We also have situations where may, uh, cert producers would say, um, you know, if you put the lines in, I'll buy your sap and I'll buy it at a really good rate, whether it's on a, I can rent your taps that are already tapped or yeah, you have yeah. just tap put in or, or I can buy, I'll give you a guaranteed uh, sap price. Exactly. And so I'll, I won't skip ahead, but I've got a slide. What we're, what I'm working on right now, um, we're working on a binding contract template um, that would be used for, this one would be used for sap sales. Um, the idea of selling a sap, selling sap to a syrup producer and again, this is a legal format. And so we're working through the concepts of what are the guarantees that the buyer would want to make sure they could express they need in the syrup, the quality of the syrup, everything from what's the minimum delivery to get started um, and what's the payment structure. So that's exactly what we're working on in the next couple of months. We're actually going to have a, a binding contract template that it will read like a legal template, but it, if it's not going to be um, signed and stamped, people can still use those as questions between the parties. And I think that's the important thing. It's anticipating what each person needs out of the relationship and getting that formalized so that there's no uncertainty about what the expectation is. And um, another another element, if I may, Mark, it's yeah. Ray. Uh, Mark and I talked about this. Uh, uh, Mark is the uh, 
editor, writer of chapter three of the new producer's manual, and I was privileged to be asked to comment on the chapters last year now. And, and I alerted Mark that in Ontario, and any of you been around OMSPA for 18 plus years, 16 plus years would remember the tax fight that we had with the Ontario government about selling SAP versus renting TAPs. And if okay. you sold SAP, it was then <clears throat> processed into SERP. So that was then an industrial, com an industrial process which would mean five times the tax rate for the sugar house because it's now an industrial complex like a welding shop that takes rough steel and makes yes. a vessel or whatever. So, so a caution, and, and OMSPA worked hard, Don Dodds, Mark Wheeler were the main architects of uh, shepherding a change through government. Uh, the, the, the lesson is that be careful uh, how you report a rental or purchase of SAP, of SAP in particular, that, you know, rental is a different story. You can write that off and you incur your costs of setting up tubing. Usually you have an agreement, but buying SAP is another uh, uh, bailiwick. So uh, a caution, and I, I don't know how Mark articulated that in the new chapter. It'd be interesting to see if we had a back and forth, but just something to be mindful of folks. Yeah, and and I appreciate that that that's some of that that's what we've been discussing. I've got someone doing legal research right now, and we're trying we're looking at current use and tax uh, tax abatement, and trying to figure out when these business to business relationships do fall within some exemption categories for agriculture. Sometimes there's a volume standard or a value standard of over fifty one percent or under fifty one percent, and it's still considered your kind of farm or ag. Yeah. And at what point it really you're considered a food processor. So good, good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, you know, and I think the reality of a lot of these is these are concepts I could say it's difficult to kind of diagnose a, or a, a clear answer. Uh, but these are the things to be thinking about. Um, I, I work with business owners that tend to be entrepreneurs. They tend to be um, creative people and thinking about the positive side. And then a lot of my role is to think about, well, what, <laughs> what could go wrong? And um we don't need that to guide your decision, but it's good to kind of have some uh, advance notice of the things to check on and regulations are one of them. Mark, there seemed to be a question here and I'm just interpreting it. Um, yeah. Uh, what was the cost uh, of the land that you used in the owned category? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just put $1,000 per acre. Uh, we have big ranges here in the US, depending on how close it is to, to a municipality or a city. Um, Certainly some higher rates down in Southern New York, maybe up to 2,000, 3,000 per acre, which gets can be a little tight, I think, with the maple forecast. In the Northeast Kingdom of, the, of Vermont, I think we certainly see things 500 to $800 an acre in large parcel transactions. So 1,000 is what I used here. Aren't you lucky? We, ha we have many places here uh, that are uh, well above a thousand let's put it that way yeah um and we're competing with well geez this is really good agricultural land uh and well just because you still have your trees on it mm, we usually pay twelve thousand dollars an acre etc or whatever it is and even in areas where i am which is uh you know not prime agricultural land it's uh, because of the uh re uh, the urban people moving out to their countryside it's now uh, upwards to three thousand dollars an acre I'm yeah. glad I bought it below a thousand, but it's no longer there. So, which accentuates the problem we have for the next generation. Yeah, exactly. Getting, getting, getting them in. And I think the big thing, you know, my, my, the, the, the reason I do my job is, is to, to figure out ways that we can all continue to steward the land and, and work on the land, but also do it in a way where we're not volunteering our time and giving all our money away, <laughs> trying to find some of that recoup, you know, recoup and recovery economically and find that sweet spot, so to speak. I know I'm going to be short of time, so I'm going to just do like two or three more slides very quick because I want to give people an understanding of the resources we have. And then maybe we'll have a minute or two just for a couple of questions from the from the chat box. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the leases, but I want people to know that we've put a lot of time into um, developing a sugar bush lease and a sugar house lease. Um, again, these are legal templates, but if anyone gets these, uh, you can download them from our website. You'll see that there, there's a lot of supplemental information that says, here's an option A or an option B, 
or here is why this is an important conversation to have as you're approaching that other landowner or that other business. Again, back to that conversation. Here are the things you should be talking about so that both parties understand the agreement they're stepping into and understand the factors um, that, that surround the relationship. Um, I won't go through this. Um, the different factors of the lease, you'll see it in the, in the title page. Um, the one thing I'll point out, the binding on heirs and assigns, that's the terminology in, in the legal world, basically says if someone were to die, what happens to the lease? Um, and this is often the fear, and this is where the bad stories often emerge from, is that the landowner dies and the lease was poorly structured or was, was structured in a way where the sugar maker was not able to maintain their security of the land because of the transition with the death. Um, and so I just want to draw people's attention to that because that seems to be the one that really can can really be the deal breaker, unfortunately. And if you're going to go this far into a legal agreement, you want to make sure that the sugar maker has the security that they, that they need. Um, I'm just going to skip through based on time. And I just uh, will take a look at some of the, the chat questions if we can. John Randall, do we still have a minute or two for questions before we oh, hand it off to Perry? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, thanks. Okay, great. Carry on. Okay, let's do, a, let's see if we got. We're never on time anyways, Mark. <laughs> I remember we started a bit late, Mark. We, we ate up the uh, beginning of your presentation there. So, yeah. That's okay. I'm just looking through the constraints. Yeah, we've got some good constraints on land and thanks. Being honest about age constraints, we certainly know that's a factor. Um, let's see, I've got a question here. Does anyone rent taps from public lands? Yes, yeah, so in Vermont, we do have a few, a small number of rental agreements with the state of Vermont, and then we have a different rate available through the U.S. Forest Service. Um, when, when this next presentation starts, if it's not inappropriate, I'll, I'll harvest, I've got it in an old presentation. We've got some rates there. They're done differently. Um, less of the actual number of the, the rental rate, they, they have a unique way of um, establishing the rate. So I'll make a note of that when, um, when I get off here, the, the Vermont state lands rental and the, and the federal one. Um, is that with or without infrastructure? I think Randall, you asked that, the dynamic of like if things are already there. Um, here's, a, here's a concept for rental that some of you may have heard that we use in, in the ag world. We call it the dirty five. D-I-R-T-I. -I. And this goes to if there's a building or any built infrastructure. The question is, what should the landowner do to cover their costs? And we use the dirty five, depreciation on any infrastructure, um, insurance on any infrastructure, repairs, annual repairs expected that the landowner would need to cover on the infrastructure, D-I-R-T. T for taxes. Another I for interest, if there's any interest on borrowed money. So that gives us depreciation, insurance, repairs, taxes, and interest. So anytime, just use that formula as a starting point. If you're a landowner or if you're a renter trying to understand where the rate should go up, you can kind of look at the cost of ownership and, and do an add-on for that. In the tap rentals, who pays for the tubing setup and maintenance? So this is a great question. Who owns the infrastructure? Well, the land is owned by the landowner. And this is where generally it seems from my observation, the sugar makers come in and they're gonna install their own tubing system as per what they want. And then the assumption is you're gonna want a lease term that goes at least 10 or 15 years, which we assume is the lifespan, the physical lifespan of the tubing, or maybe the, um, the functional lifespan based on technology and changes that are a decade out. So we would hope you could secure a 10 or 15 year lease if you're gonna put all your money into a tubing system on someone else's property. That'd be the only way to, you know, to feel comfortable that you're gonna get the lifespan, lifespan out of it. In some cases we see landowners putting tubing systems in and rather than a lease, that's where we get into some partnership agreements. And we're seeing that develop where landowners are making their investments and then bringing in the sugar maker as either a business partner or maybe as a third party contractor. So now we've got these different types of relationships that can form based on who's got the capital or who's got the preference to maybe own the setup. Um, but it's a good example in that 
there are different ways to do this. And there may be a situation where the landowner, again, with no sugaring capacity or management skills may decide they're willing to make the investment if they have a, they know a party that could manage it for them. And that could be a beautiful partnership. Everyone brings their own skills and resources to the table to see that property become a productive sugar bush. Um, what is the proper length of a contract? We, we would hope to see at least 10 or 15 years. Um, and we've seen some 10 years and we've thought hmm, that's not quite long enough for the tubing lifespan. Um, but there's been some reasons they haven't been all stretched out to 15. Gosh, 20 seems like a long time. I don't know. 20 does seem like a long time. And I think the technology changes enough that I don't know if you necessarily need to be there 20 years out, at least to recoup your investment in the tubing system. But it's something to think about for sure. Uh, let's do one more here. Is a 10 year is a 10 year lease with a cost of setup and rental on a thousand tap bush viable? Well, Mark, that's a great question. <laughs> and we'd have to look at that. We'd have to map it out. Um, I've seen different net incomes from all sorts of scales of operations. So it really goes back to the individual business and um, what that business model is. I'm a little cautious on smaller scale enterprises under 3,000 taps. Not that they can't be profitable, but they're generally moving into part-time income territory. Um, so something, really something to, I think, put the pencil to paper on. We got a few questions and comments mixed in, and what I can do is put together some answers. Um, and maybe rather than do it while Perry's talking, I'll save it all and send it back in the chat so I can keep keep the program going if that's all right. Well, well, thank you very much, Mark. We uh, really appreciate this. Uh, as I say, it was a requested presentation to understand new forms of uh, business arrangements we may need to operate in as we uh, adopt, I should say, as as we move forward with this industry. Um, again, we do really uh, look forward to actually seeing you in person. And uh, just to let folks know, I said there's dialogue going on with Mark, the two Marks, and with the famous two Marks, Mark Canella and Mark Yeah, Iselhart. Mark Iselhart, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's one of them. Uh, and um, from both an applied research and training perspective, as well as so that we can find what people need here in Ontario and source it out. Uh, to the appropriate party. And sometimes we can do develop things under joint venture as well uh, to get the right training that could be shared amongst the producers. Yeah. I mean, we have access technically to Centre Assir in Quebec, um, but it's mostly all in French. Can some of us uh, who uh, predominantly uh, are working in English work together on some of these training courses, et cetera? The other point I want to point out is, is that uh, We'd surely love if we in Ontario had this type of service where the University of Vermont was uh, was was located here in Ontario, or we or we had the equivalent and the extension service because in the past we've had elements of that, but they have not persisted. Let's put that they have not carried on, and so whether we recreate that um, physically in Ontario or whether we work with you and others on some sort of a joint arrangement to offer our maple uh, cert producers the, the support that they, they've they been asking for and, and, and need. Um, I think there's more and more opportunities for us to work together, Mark. Yeah, well, I appreciate the invitation to present and I, I can say that I've met all 70 plus people here, well, 98. So you certainly got a group of people interested and uh, we'd be willing to partner and, and find that find that place to collaborate without a doubt. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll get to this chat box here, see what I can produce. Excellent. Um, going to the next uh, step and the second presenter in our uh, evening, um, inf virtual information evening, I'd uh, like to welcome uh, Perry Wilson, uh, who is the Vice President of Operations for Ontario. And what that means is he's a senior person for Farm Credit Corporation in the province of Ontario. And Perry's been with FCC since 1995, and he is committed to helping the Ontario agriculture and food industry grow and evolve by building great relationships, understanding the customers and delivering value where he and his organization can. 
They're focused on that. His vision is to position Farm Credit Corporation as an industry leader who supports all sectors, I'll underline that, all sectors, and all sizes of enterprises. And I think you may have some insights as to the ability for different sizes and focuses of enterprises to actually be uh, uh, quite profitable and potential uh, clients of FCC. Uh, Perry grew up on a hog farm in uh, Oxford County and is a graduate of uh, Wilfrid Laurie University and also the uh, University of Guelph uh, and Rural Ontario Institute's joint program which is referred to the, as the Advanced Agriculture Leadership Program. Those of us who have attended that, uh, I'm from class two, you're from class eight, uh, we refer to as the ELP program. And, um, and we wanna have more involvement with that as the maple sector in the future, I can imagine as we develop our leaders. And uh, Perry is um, extremely passionate about agriculture and leadership. And he'll speak to you about the whole issue of succession was becoming much more prevalent in our discussion these days as, as we've done some uh, surveys of our membership and on average we're 63 years of age and that bell curve is, it goes up to it and down from it fairly quickly without being spread across nicely across the, uh, the bell curve. So, uh, and I've known Perry for a little while, but I've mostly known his brother who was an agrologist with the uh, uh, with uh, the Bank of Nova Scotia when I was one with the Bank of Montreal. Uh, so yes, um, let's, uh, let's introduce, uh, let's welcome uh, 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 Perry to make some presentations. Thank you, Perry. We can't hear him. We need some sound there. Hi, Perry. You've cut out. Must be your headphones. You might have to switch to your, your earbuds. Nope, still can't hear you. Nope. that there we go there you got voices can you hear me now yep 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 okay that's better all right good stuff i'm just i'm just going to share my screen here hopefully that's a little smoother than the uh than the microphone went Believe it or not, we actually tested all this out the other day and everything worked fine. Yeah, yeah, with the, with the, it was a few, a few trials that at the John. All right, just give me a sec here. Okay. Uh, hey, John, just let me, John or Randall, just let me know. Can you hear me and you can see the presentation? Yes. All good. Okay. Good stuff. Well, good evening, everyone. Hey, Mark, that was a really uh, interesting presentation there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to uh, profess to say I know a lot about the maple syrup industry and, you know, I'm, I'm getting to getting to know a bit more Randall and I had a good conversation there several weeks ago and he shared some insights with me and uh, shared with me some of the work that the organization is doing just on your strategic planning. And I, and I have a few thoughts around that as well in, in uh, some of my slides here. So I have, I have about 35 minutes of talking here, guys, and I know you've, we've got about 35 minutes left here. So I, as far as questions, uh, John Randall, what do you think? Should I maybe hold those to the end? Maybe you could put them in the chat box. If we could stay on a little bit longer, if there's some burning questions, and or I can address some things afterwards as well. How's that yeah, sound? Let, let's leave stuff to the end. Do your presentation, yep. and then un, uh, let people ask questions and unload the uh, 
unload the box. If we go a few minutes longer, that's okay too, because we started somewhat late, a little bit late. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. No, as you mentioned, I've been around FCC for uh, for 27 years and in formal leadership roles here for the last uh, 17 or so years. And I, I'll tell you from from the time I started in the business, you know, it's it's been uh, energizing playing a role and assisting families and business owners achieving their dreams and all that good stuff. And I was actually talking to a senior relationship manager earlier on today, and they talked about a young, he talked about a young family that uh, we're financing that, uh, that they had uh, lived across the road from, from a uh, sugar bush and they, you know, got to know the current owner and uh, that, that owner decided to retire and that young family took over the sugar bush. And that, that's exactly, I know, the, the type of scenario that Mark was talking about and uh, just the, the, the energy in the relationship manager's voice when he was telling the story. That's kind of what, what makes our job all worth it. So uh, tonight I'm going to share a little bit with you about FCC. Uh, just going to offer a few tips on some boring basics and some things to think about when you're looking to, to propose financing, a financing package here at FCC and get just one slide on the farm economy here. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about transition. And finally, I'm just gonna fair, share a few thoughts just around uh, the strategy work that you're doing. Yeah, so just who's FCC? We've been around since 1959. Uh, we're a, a federal crown. That me means that we re report and receive our direction from the federal government on, on how to support the growth and prosperity of in the Canadian agriculture and agri-food industry. And uh, we're, we're not your typical financial institution. We're 100%, uh, we, we lend 100% to, to the Canadian agriculture and, uh, and agri-food sectors. So that, of course, we build strong relationships and share knowledge and expertise exclusively with producers, agribusinesses, and food and beverage entrepreneurs in the country. I don't know if you guys knew, but agriculture contributes $155 billion annually to Canada's GDP. And uh, Canada is one of the world's top agriculture and agri-food trading nations, and we employ over 3 million people every year. And FCC is a unique position as not only an agriculture lender, but also a supporter to the industry. And I'll share a little bit to, more with you later on the presentation about what, what that means, about how we provide further, further support to the, the industry. So we have seven uh, business lines. The first one's uh, primary production, agriculture. Uh, second one is, is uh, agribusiness and agri-food. Now I'll, sh I'll just define that a little bit in the next slide. And corporate alliances, that, that means you can, you can obtain FCC financing at point of sale at the, uh, if you want to finance a piece of equipment or finance your, your crop inputs. Uh, so if, if uh, the dealer that you are dealing with is uh, a participating partner with FCC financing at point of sale, you could ob obtain third party financing there from FCC. We loan in, uh, life insure uh, uh, many of our products. We have uh, accounting software and also field management software. Uh, we also have a number of different knowledge offerings and our FCC ventures. So, so, so we've, uh, we invest in funds that promote entrepreneurship and innovation uh, to help fill the gaps in some of the underserved aspects of our industry. So our, we're just under a $44 billion portfolio right now, and we serve 100,000 customers from coast to coast. Uh, we have 2,100 employees and 100, 101 offices, and about 20 of those offices are uh, in Ontario. So yeah, 84% of that, that portfolio is primary production agriculture. So that means uh, things like beef, dairy, poultry, hogs, fruits and vegetables, grains and oil seeds, uh, greenhouses and of course uh, ma maple syrup production kind of it's it's partially primary production but then there's some some further processing so it kind of falls in the primary production realm as well as our agribusiness and agri-food so which is 16 percent of our portfolio and so that ma many of you might not know that so you know from the time that Randall you uh uh, worked for FCC way back earlier in your career. F from that t at that point in time, we were, we just loaned money to to primary producers. But uh, 
now we finance everything from from the farm to uh, to, to the table. And actually, actually, if you think about the farm, if you think about a, a chain, the middle length of that chain is is the farm, and we finance everything that per, uh, supplies inputs to that farming operation, and we can finance anything that's a further processing of that primary product. So just for instance, crop input suppliers and retailers, equipment manufacturers and dealers, feed processors, food processors. So again, I think uh, uh, maple syrup production would fall into that as well. Bakeries and e even wineries and distilleries. So if you can think of anything that you see on your uh, kitchen, your dinner table, in the, in the, your breakfast table in the morning, your dinner table at night, uh, we can finance the, the business that manufactured that. This is just a breakdown of our portfolio. So you'll see the biggest chunk of that is grains and oil seeds at, at 31%. Uh, dairy is the next biggest at 16%. And then if you look at uh, like about 10 o'clock there on that, on that pie chart, it says other. And maple syrup uh, production would be included in that 5% other. And I'll just break that down a little bit more here. So if you, if you look at this chart, you'll see our national portfolio there at 43.6 billion. And of that 366 million of that portfolio is involved in uh, maple syrup production. So j just actually it's significant, eh? It's, it's just, just under 1% of our portfolio is maple syrup production. And, and then if you look over on the right-hand side of that chart, you'll see uh, Quebec's total portfolio is just under 6 billion. But of that, 331 million of it are maple syrup production. So it's that's that's the most significant chunk of uh, of the portfolio, but actually by by a long stretch is in Quebec. So that's 5.61 percent of their portfolios represented in maple syrup production. And then if you look uh, one to the left there, you'll see Ontario. Uh, our total portfolio is 12.6 billion. And about 10 million of that is is in maple syrup production. So uh, uh, 0.08% in the province. So, so uh, a, a pretty small piece of the overall pie in Ontario. And uh, hey, uh, FCC is here to support uh, ma making that bigger and, and supporting the, the strategy and, uh, and vision that you're working on. So I, I just, next I'm gonna to talk to you just a little bit about some borrowing basics. If, you, if you're looking to obtain uh, financing for, for FCC and, and, and other financial institutions for that matter. And so, and so whether you're a new producer or borrowing for the first time, and uh, even if you borrowed for the, uh, if, you, if uh, you haven't borrowed for a while, I'm, I'm hopefully you're gonna learn a couple tips here in the next few slides. So first of all, when a lender advances a loan, it's a contractual arrangement. So the borrower requires funding to finance an investment in their business. And there's always an element of risk in these arrangements for, for both the borrower and the lender. So the borrower mitigates their risk through their, their ability to operate a viable business and generate sufficient income to meet their own needs, as well as to meet the obligations they've, they've committed to their lender. And then the lender, mitigates uh, their risks through conducting due diligence during the application process and also put, putting conditions and security in place that mitigates the risks of unforeseen circumstances arising down the road. So some of the basic documentation required by a lender in order to conduct this due diligence are first of all net worth statement and that demonstrates the financial strength of your business at a point in time. Tax returns and income and expense statements illustrate the past financial performance of your business. Cash flow analyses uh, demonstrate uh, the ability of your business to generate cash, generate cash. And projections demonstrate your expected future financial performance. And your business plan outlines your strategy, vision, goals, and structure to name a few things. And, and it's a document that enables you and your family and your partners all to be on the same page. And uh, you know, speaking from a lender standpoint, it helps a lender to anticipate future needs. And, and when we're able to do that, we can be a, a better partner and we can be uh, more proactive and less transactional. So, so lenders, uh, 
uh, different lenders have have different frameworks by which they analyze credit, and and one of those uh, frameworks is the five C's of credit, and that happens to be what FCC uses to analyze our our uh, ag production enterprises. So I'll just go through those with you quickly. The first one's character, and that assesses the experience and capabilities of the business management uh, folks. It includes planning skills and experience, uh, financial skills. Uh, credit history, things like uh, years in business, education, enterprise. Capacity addresses the past financial performance and expected future uh, a performance of the enterprise. Uh, we look at this because past financial, we look at past fi financial performance because it's an indicator of the future viability and the likelihood of loans being repaid as agreed. Uh, for, for capacity, we utilize your, your financial statements and your projections, of course. So commitment is the owner's commitment to the enterprise and it's crucial to its success. We consider both financial and non-financial commitment to the business. So, so in short, it's, a, it's just a, it's a measurement of the, the skin that you have in the game. A few ways we look at commitment is through the, the strength of your balance sheet and, and your willingness to, to back up the loan with, with your guarantee. Conditions assess how the future viability of the enterprise might be impacted either positively or negatively by external factors. Uh, these are factors that the business can't control. Uh, we evaluate external conditions related to the business, such as legislation that could affect the industry. Uh, I heard, heard uh, there was uh, mentioned by one of the speakers there earlier, you just, just around, uh, you know, taxes as it relates to the commercial enterprise, the, the, the sugar shack and the actual maple syrup production itself. That would be an example. Uh, market conditions, current and future potential macroeconomic impact and uh, potential environmental impact. And collateral is quite simply the secondary source of repayment in the event the business is unable to meet its obligations. So it, it, it uh, comes in the form of pledging assets such as land, buildings, equipment, and livestock. And FCC has, uh, we have an internal appraisal department to assist with value, valuations of, of land in particular. Uh, just, just a few other thoughts around the five seeds. So I describe credit assessment as a mix of art and science. And, and the science is the numbers and the art is assessing the business owner's ability to execute on their business plan and, and, and to run the business and, and just, just to make it happen. And the five C's is a, a framework we use to, to make that assessment. And I, I was recently asked about uh, what I felt was the most important of the five C's. And I, after putting a little bit of thought into that, my answer was character. Uh, and although they're all important and uh, we can't make a decision just based on character alone, but with, without a strong a farm and business management practices, the demonstrated ability to run the business, uh, none, none, none of the other stuff really matters. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about interest rates here. So there are two types of interest rates, variable and fixed. Variable rates are subject to change, and they generally follow the Bank of Canada overnight rate. Uh, they're, they're typically used for revolving credit lines, operating loans, and, and construction loans. And the Bank of Canada overnight rate is the rate at which financial institutions borrow and lend money from each other. And from, and from the Bank of Canada to meet short-term obligations. Uh, so last week, as many of you know, the Bank of Canada held firm at uh, 25 basis points and they meet eight times a year. I guess they'll be meeting seven more times this year. They meet again in March. And most economists, well, most economists were speculating that it was gonna, it was gonna jump uh, last week, but uh, uh, was that last week or was, this, or was that this week? Anyways, recently here, but where it's coming up again in uh, in March, and speculation is again that it's going to jump, and it can jump by as much as fifty basis points in those when they meet. So so stay tuned for that. 
Now, fixed rates, uh, they provide certainty over the term of a loan. Uh, they're determined by the bond market and bond rates uh, depend on, on more factors than just the overnight rate. The, the free market sets these rates and even when prime rate is not changing, the bond rates likely are and they typically change daily. Now that said, once we uh, fix the, the, those rates, uh, you're, you're guaranteed that rate until the end of the, the term that you select. So just talk a little bit about here products and the length of term and how you might uh, think that through. So, so typically the longer the term, the higher the rate. And uh, the, the purpose of the loan might determine whether you take a fixed rate or, the, or a variable rate. For fixed asset, you typically lock your rate in for a fixed term. But for short team term needs like a construction loan or operating credit, you typically use a variable rate because you're borrowing and repaying money incrementally. Uh, so you might ask, your, ask yourself a question, how long are you planning on keeping that uh, asset? So for instance, if you plan to sell your asset in a short period of time, you're likely wanna, gonna wanna consider a, a shorter term to avoid uh, early payment penalties. Uh, you'll also want to look at how you've structured the rest of your, your debt. So a strategy might be if you have several different loans to hedge your dollar cost average by, by selecting different terms. So you don't have everything, have everything maturing in, in the same year. So amortization. Uh, loan payments are amortized, meaning they're divided into equal payments over a period of years at a set payment frequency. Frequency, so that's typically a monthly, quarterly, or annually. In the early years on a blended payment loan, most of the payment goes towards interest, while, and in the later years, of course, most of it goes towards principal. The amount of interest versus principal has ramifications for income tax, since interest payments are deductible, are deductible expense, uh, and principal payments aren't. Perry. Uh, yep. This yep. is Randall. It looks like you're you're on one slide, and you've been on it for quite a while. We've been talking about different subject areas. I wonder if you need to Oh, okay. I am advancing and it looks as though you are not then. Hmm. John, can you help that out, please? Yeah. Uh, Give me one here. second. If you can unshare, Perry. Stop here, sharing. Just, just I can share it from my side and then advance it for you. Okay, hang on. All right, so think about this for a second. Okay, did that stop sharing for you? Uh, yes, John? yes, okay. you're on amortization. Yep. Okay. Okay, good stuff. Then uh, I will. Well, it should be off. When I can pause, can you can ahead. you see that? You should be able to see that on your screen. Yeah. No, I'm good. I'm. Uh, uh, I can't see that right now, just with the view I have up. But that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Just so for used equipment, you, you you'd likely amortize for five to seven years, and say for for land loans, you'd likely amortize for a maximum twenty nine years, but a typical land loan would be 20 to the, the 20 to 25 year range. Uh, so yeah, and you might want to just consider amortization when you're thinking about that on, on just what, what is your overall strategy. So if, you're, if your strategy is rapid debt reduction uh, to free up cash flow down the road, you likely want shorter amortizations or if it's keeping payments low uh, right now, so you can maximize cash flow in order to invest in other areas of your operation, then you might want to go that way. So you should go to payments now, John. Yep. Uh, yep. So pay payments are, are made through cash flow. And as I noted there earlier, past performance is the strongest indicator of future performance. So, so you and your lender want to be very confident that your operation can meet its obligation. So, so just be realistic and thoughtful in, in that exercise. And uh, also to consider is payment frequency. So, so it should also match your cash flow. So for instance, in the dairy operation, you're likely gonna have monthly payments because they have regular monthly milk checks. 
but a, a maple syrup operation, you, you'd likely have annual payments or at least less frequent uh, seasonal payments. So we have, FCC has uh, over 20, 20 different loan products, but I'll just outline a few here. We have a flexi, flexi loan. So that, that allows you at your discretion to pause payments for, uh, for a year once in every five year increment. So if you have a 15 year amortization, for instance, and you have the flexi loan product, once every five year increment, you could, you could uh, pause your payment at your discretion, either to provide cash flow relief or just to free up capital for, for, for new projects. We have an advancer loan, so that, that's a pre-approved pre uh, uh, pre-approval for, for multiple draws. So, so when you need new funds for whatever, for, for uh, uh, purchases, obviously they have to be for, for, for farm use or agribusiness use, uh, you, you can keep on re-advancing on them up to the, up to the maximum pre-approved amount. We have energy loans. So that encourages the use of alternative energy like geothermal, wind, solar, biogas. And, uh, and the uh, feature around that one is that there's the processing fees are way for the first half million dollars and there's deferred and interest only payments available in that one as well. And a transition loan. So, so this one facilitates the, the transition of your farm through guaranteeing the vendor payment of a portion of the sale price over a five-year period. So just, just a quick example of that one would be, let's say you're selling your farm for a million dollars and uh, uh, the, 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 the vendor would go to FCC and let's say borrow 700,000 of that. The vendor holds back 300,000 of that and FCC would pay the vendor back over five years that 300,000 or guarantee them payment. Of, of their 300,000 they held back over a period of five years. So that's been a good tool for uh, uh, an, uh, allowing young producers into the market. So just overall, our lending philosoph philosophy is cash flow repays your loans, not equity. Uh, lenders rarely finance an operation on the basis that, a, that if things go poorly, poorly they can for foreclose on their assets. And obviously there must be a realistic expectation that the operation will generate enough cash to, to make its debt payments. Yeah, and this is just a quick one. I asked our senior economist, JP Gervais, just to put, put together a, a few, uh, what he thought were the top four uh, uh, economic uh, uh, comments that he'd like to make. And so inflation isn't out of control. He said, yet. I don't know, I think we're running around four and a half or so percent inflation and the target inflation rate is 2%. And he's still confident that overall inflation is going to uh, uh, slow in the second half of, of the year. He, that said, he said, food inflation is going to slow, but prices are gonna remain elevated simply because uh, cost of production is high and, uh, and the entire supply chain matters. And, and, and there's additional costs just, just in, in, uh, in that supply chain. Uh, interest rates will rise and he notes there's an opportunity to lock in. And I heard him speak the other day and he said that particularly on rates that like above five, five years and above, that's where you might find bargains right now with, uh, with fixed interest rates, just because of, of where bond rates are relative to the, to the shorter term rates. Uh, demand for food is robust, both uh, domestically and abroad, and, and, and the labor issues that mainly a lot of those were brought on at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, those aren't gonna go away. So we're gonna continue to have problems solve to, to solve with labor issues within all sectors of the industry. So I'm going to just talk a bit about succession planning here. So uh, ever since I've been around the industry, we've been we've been talk about, talking about talking uh, about lack of succession planning being an issue in 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 the ag industry. So just a few stats here: 92% of Canadian farmers uh, farms have no transition plan ready, uh, or if you want to look at class, I guess 8% full 8% of Canadian farmers do have a written transition plan. 75% uh, of the farms are going to uh, uh, change hands over the next 10 years. And so, so I think based on that, we can agree that the ag industry could be doing a better job at developing uh, the next generation of farm leaders through succession planning. 
And just uh, next page there, you'll see you'll see stats there uh, over the 15 years that are reported have went have risen from uh, uh, 50 to 54, and then I see uh, I've heard that, that that number likely today is closer to 60. So really, over the last 20 years, we've like the average age of uh, Canadian farmers went from 50 to 60, and I think I heard you say, Randall, that in in the maple syrup industry, that's uh, 63. So. Uh, the same trend is is evident. Yeah, so transition takes takes years and and usually involves two or three uh, generations. And and throughout my career, I've seen uh, good stories and I've seen some tough stories as well as as it relates to transition. So just when I think about uh, the formula for success, uh, some of the following things come to mind. Uh, Individuals need to be thoughtful about their intentions, dreams, and desires, and they need to come to the table uh, with clarity and be willing to share. All parties need to be willing to not only share, but to listen. Uh, regular communication, it's not, it's not a once and done thing. And, uh, and, and all parties actually need to be at the table. Uh, so in the end, all this can be summarized is uh, excellent and open communication. And I'd also say that in my experience, the inverse is also true. So if all parties are not clear and thoughtful on their intentions, and if there's not a culture of safety in the family, it, it doesn't tend to go well. Uh, years go by and, and nothing changes and tension builds. So my advice is uh, start now and, and, and start small. And, and so to that end, I, I'm not sure how many of you are available or, or, or aware rather, but FCC offers transition advisory services through business advisors. We've been doing this for, we started pilots on this, I believe in about 2016. And, and now we have uh, a permanent staff across the country uh, for our, our business advisory services. And, and so, and, and, and when you speak with them, you don't have to have a plan in mind and, and, and they can, and our business advisors can help walk you through that and help you provide tools to be thoughtful and about your intentions and, and just how to communicate as a family. And the good news about this is it's a free service and it's just driven by our mandate to serve the industry. And it's just the right thing to do for the betterment of the industry. Um, and, and just what that looks like, uh, it's face-to-face. -face. Uh, of course, that has been a challenge over the last couple of years here. So it's we can also do it over the phone or Teams video or FaceTime or Zoom or, 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 or whatever the media that, that works best. So yeah, just, just a little bit, you know, there, there's likely a reason that that number is only 8% that a lot of people maybe shy away from it because they maybe heard there's a lot of uh, drama involved in transition turns uh, in the transition process. And, um, you know, we find when families first think about transition, they, they underestimate exactly how many considerations and decisions can be involved. And once they start down the road and get into it, uh, it, it just gets overwhelming and sometimes they back off. And for sure, it could be difficult. There's lots of unknowns. It's an expensive process. Uh, business, you know, you might think that the business depends on, on, on me. Uh, and there's loss of prestige and, and identity if I'm, if I'm moving out or if I'm the one transitioning on. And, and no one else, you might feel no one else has the skills. Uh, you might feel controlling the business, you know, keeps your family close. You want to avoid conflict. Uh, you might feel like you're being forced out. Uh, and, 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 uh, and maybe you just don't know what to do. So, so there's lots of things that are going through your mind when you're thinking about transition. So just, just this around this idea of the family uh, sitting around the kitchen table and, uh, and, 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 and coming to a common vision. I, I recently heard a speaker talking about four types of, of communication. First one's dismissal. Uh, that's the, or the bubble syndrome. So you might come to the table with your own opinion and, uh, and just be dis dismissive of, of, of the others. Debate, that's where everybody comes to the table with their own opinion, but there's, uh, but, but, but there's no listening. And dialogue, that's where 
we're seeking, we're starting to seek to others, understand others' points of view. And then the, this whole idea of collective creativity, and that's where the outcome is, is, is not, not the idea of just one family member, but all ideas are taken, to con taken into consideration. And uh, you have an outcome where the, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So my, my experience with farm families is that typically the most successful are those that have clear and common goals and visions they and visions as they as and they as, and that they work as a team. And if everyone's preference is kept in mind, that idea of collective creativity, the odds of progress are, are of uh, are F's and success are much higher. Uh, this means that yeah, it's going to mean that you're going to need to have many conversations. And just, yeah, this idea that uh, working with family means everything is personal. 98% of the farming uh, operations in Canada are, are family uh, uh, operations. And the beauty of most Canadian farms is that they're operated by families. And equally, the challenge of most Canadian farms is they're operated by families. So yeah, just what's next after after we've kind of uh, aligned on a, on a vision, we need to, it's, it's time to talk and to consider what else you might need. And there are lots of uh, 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 folks that specialize on this in, in the industry and typically what they foc focus on is tax and estate planning. But there's a lot more things to consider. And this, this is where these are going through this list. All of these aren't going to be uh, relevant to your operation, but some of them will be. And that, that, uh, that uh, transition uh, specialist, our business advisor is gonna help you walk through that and, and uh, determine which ones are relevant to you. And then, um, you know, when it comes to talking to other professionals, you know, uh, listen to your instincts and uh, I, I know take a critical view. And, and if you're not clear on the steps being taken, ask questions. If, if you, if you, or if you're not comfortable with the proposed solution or if you don't like what's being heard, don't be afraid to go ask for a second opinion. But, but at the same time, at the, at the same time, you know, your advisor might question you and come up with, uh, you know, ideas that might be contrary to the way you're thinking and uh, be, obje uh, be objective about their opinions as well, too, and keep an open mind. So, you know, for instance, maybe your farm business, they might be saying it can't support your planned retirement or multiple families retirement. Uh, and I've certainly seen this scenario. So the point here is an advisor who consistently has your best interest in mind it for sure is a valuable asset to your business. And they're going to alert you to the to the good things and, and, and of course, to the bad situations. Perry, Perry, we're, we're, yep. out, we're out of sequence on our slides. Yeah, what slide are you on, Perry? Uh, I, I'm the ugly baby one. Okay, because you know what number that one is? 36. 36, thank you. We're on there the pie go. one, yeah. The what one? Oh, the pie, no, keep going until you get to the ugly baby. Ugly yeah. baby's up now, that's okay. 37. So, so I just spoke to that. And the point there is guys, is that uh, you know, if, if a, an advisor might give you some advice that is contrary to the way you're thinking, and just I'm saying keep an open mind and, uh, and, and keep an objective view. And just, okay, I'm on the tr transitioning your farm slide. So just final thoughts. Transition can take years. Every transition is unique. Uh, it's very important to find a common vision, uh, leverage your ex uh, experts and figure out the how to and uh, keep those FCC transition specialists in mind. And final piece of advice is get started. Okay, so this, this should be the vision slide as well. So I had a good talk with Randall a few weeks ago and he, and he shared you're building out a strategy and, uh, and working on a vision for the industry. And yet you haven't landed on a final vision statement, but I understand you're, you're exploring this idea of le leveraging the value of your smaller niche businesses uh, in Ontario and by marketing a higher quality product on a, on a smaller scale that'll generate, you know, hopefully larger margins for your members. So, you know, I, I don't claim to know 
uh, uh, in-depth detail about the maple syrup industry in Ontario, but but for me, that sounds uh, exciting and inspirational, and it sounds like you're, you're really on to something. So, I mean, here's here's what I do know. There's uh, f- f- close to 56 million taps in Quebec, and they have planned to increase that moving forward, and Ontario has two, 2 million taps. StatsCan says there's uh, just over 3,000 producers. That was in 2016, and that, that may even be, be inflated. And uh, there are 600 members in, uh, uh, on the, in the Ontario Maple Syrup Producers Association. Uh, also, uh, based on, on conversations with Randall as well, it sounds like 3,000 tree, trees as a min, uh, taps, rather, as a minimum viable part time operation and 80% of the membership are, are, are under this and 17% are profitable. And 20,000 20, taps are full-time viable and there are only seven of those in the province. So if Randall had come back to me and, and told me that they're going down the road of a vision uh, to, to, to exceed Quebec production by 2030, for instance, I might not have uh, been as optimistic and felt that you're on the right track. So with that said, I've uh, heard a story here recently. This is a bit of a history lesson about this uh, treasure hunter explorer. His name was Cortez, and uh, he that he was uh, they were sailing from Cuba to the Yucatan Peninsula in the early 1500s, and they had a certain goal to uh, to to, to uh, uh, find s- s- some riches that the Mayans had. So the part of that part of it, uh, there's a bad part of this story, but the point I'm trying to make with this is around around commitment. So when Cortez, when they landed on the shore, he's he, he start some of the there are five or six hundred sailors that he had with them, and he, some of the folks were. Uh, were uh, starting to may- maybe not be, he, fe- he felt they weren't as committed to the cause. So he said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to burn the ships. There's no, there's no turning back. And uh, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to play all in on this. So I guess my advice to you or counsel to you would be once you have landed on, on, on a vision is, uh, and, and you have, have you answered all your questions and you're, and you're comfortable with the vision, uh, burn the ships and commit to it. And here, I'm gonna just, the, the next slides, guys, I know we're really running uh, past time here, are on uh, several of our resources, all of which can, we have a lot of knowledge resources and they're all accessible on our website. So I, I invite you to go there and just click the knowledge tab on our web, website. There's a, some virtual events, a Young Farmers Summit coming up on March 22nd, a Women's Summit on March 8th. Of course, these are all virtual at this point. I believe Randall shared this one with uh, Michael Bon Masso uh, coming up. He shared this with your membership already. And uh, also this this University of Wealth Agriculture uh, Management uh, Foundation, sorry, Foundations in Agriculture Management uh, course. So this is this is another free resource, and uh, it's a partnership between FCC, RBC, and the University of Wealth. And it covers off, you know, the, the basics of business, so business planning, financial literacy, people management, risk management, transition, and mental health. And, and, and I think I already mentioned it, it's, it's free. So there's uh, wealthagriculturemanagement.com is, is the website you go to. And uh, we did a soft launch on this a couple of months ago, and I'm hearing lots of uh, great things about that. And yes, Ag Day in Canada is on February 22nd. I, and I, ha- I got to share this story with you. I, I did a trip to Ireland about five or six years ago. And uh, at, at the, we, we were there for about 10 days or so. At the end of each day, we stayed in this little village called Hollywood. And we went to this little pub. And I got to know the, the bartender, Patrick, pretty well at that pub. And uh, Patrick is one of these guys that knew, uh, it seemed to know a lot about everything. And of course, he'd traveled to Canada before. And he said, uh, you know, I said, what, what do you remember most about it? Well, other than the mountains, he said, maple syrup. He said, I brought home maple syrup. And he said, uh, you know, when, when, when I ran out of that uh, bottle of maple syrup, oh, it was so sad. I used to put it on my, my uh, cereal every morning. And oh, it was just, I felt, and I said, do you know what, Patrick? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you. When I get back home, I'm gonna I'm gonna mail you a bottle of maple syrup, and so I wanted to keep my commitment. I went bottle of, bought bought a bottle of maple syrup, went to Canada Post to, to mail it, 
and uh, it was going to cost me 75 bucks to mail that bottle of maple syrup to Patrick. So I, I backed off a bit and uh, I had a buddy that was going back over as telling him this story to visit his daughter a, a month or so later. And he delivered the bottle of maple syrup to Patrick. And he told me that Patrick literally wept when he saw that uh, bottle of maple syrup. So I just wanted to you know that's how much Ontario maple syrup means to uh, uh, some folks around the world. And, uh, and, and that there's some value in that emotion. So with that, I know I'm, I'm a bit over here, guys, and uh, I'll put it back to you, John and Randall. You did buy local, right, Barry? Absolutely. Can you see that? <laughs> 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 oh yeah okay <laughs> i live i live just west of london there's a few uh, pretty significant maple syrup operations pretty close to me down here frank so, yeah. just, just making sure just making sure yeah absolutely i was ready for that one <laughs> yeah well, thank you thank you very much perry um i don't know whether you want to get questions uh, from the audience here or you want to answer some of the uh the chat stuff. Um, maybe we just get from the audience because you're probably a fair bit in the chat there. It'd be a little hard to unload it. Okay. There's a number of people vouching for some of your your your, your products and services as such. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> if you have it, if you want, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say one of the I think a number of questions I saw was the young entrepreneurs, the young farmers. Uh, and I think, but I think you answered that in one of those uh, those uh, transition loans or flex loans or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And we also have, uh, there's our, our young farmer product as well. It's, that's a, now up to a million and a half dollars as well too. So that comes with, uh, so there's some, some preferred interest rates and preferred fees for that too, as, as well as, uh, you know, a little bit higher leverage as well. Yeah. And of course, I mean, so, all that has to fit in with with the rest of the, the puzzle as well, too, yeah, right? Yeah. A, there needs to there needs to be a repayment demonstrated, of course, too. Barry, you were <laughs> mentioning your your video sessions or your blogs uh, or your um, et cetera. Um, you started sharing those ones with us, and we've actually started sending them out as a resource for our members. Um, oh, fantastic! One, for example, that really excited me, which was the one with. Um, uh, Terry O'Reilly on, on on marketing and marketing your products. Eh? So that that's exciting. There's there's some really good resources, and it sort of ties together with finding the match, finding what our members' needs are, and matching them with a supply, and, and playing that broker role per se. And if mm -hmm. mutually find there's a gap, working on how to create a way to fill a gap. So it, it's I think it's going to be about all these partnerships that we create with the FCC, with University of Mont, et cetera, et cetera. I noticed on one of your slides that appeared there, it uh, talked about, um, um, you know, uh, partnerships and, you know, relationships you want to develop. Um, you also mentioned the 3000 tap uh, sort of line. Um, that actually came out of some work that uh, um, Mark Canella, who I don't know if he's still on the line or not, uh, did back a few years ago. We, Looked at various different rates. There he is. Yeah, yeah, I'm still, I'm still here. Yeah, there we go. And and, and you know, never, nothing is actually a hard fixed number, but it's sort of an indicative number to sort of talk about. And some of the work we did in the cost production sort of looks towards that number, reaffirms it, the more or less, and that you know is a part time commercial operation there, i.e., that meets all those requirements of. Uh, paying yourself, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there was, we just said, well, what does that mean to our membership as compared to our membership? So nothing's hard and fast. Anyways, uh, Mark, you may want to say something as well, you know, based upon what Perry's presented, because you've worked a lot in succession. And, uh, and um, you know, since I brought that subject up about that 3000 level, you've also talked to me about, yeah, what that really means or not. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think Perry, great presentation. I just really appreciate the, the, the dynamic with transfer and succession, um, you know, there's really two things going on. And I think Perry did a great job. That I love the dismissal, debate, dialogue, and you know, collective creativity. Uh, mm. As a farm business planner, a lot of times when I do transfer meetings, I become family therapist and don't get to talk much at all about farmer finances. Um, yet the dynamic of succession, I think it's important for people to realize there's there, there's more than two things, but 
there's a family dynamic that needs attention in the process. Like Perry said, safety, you got to have a place where people can feel comfortable, Mm -hmm. not just sharing their dreams, but I think the reality is dealing with their vulnerabilities, you know, uh, uh, Mm -hmm. and those are big things at the same time, there's a certain business diagnosis. And there was a chat there. What what, what can we get to get the younger generation interested in maple production? Well, at first, I don't think many younger generations have a problem with maple production. However, maple business ownership is a different thing, you know, and um, how do you get someone interested in maple business ownership? Well, profitability is a good motivator. Mm -hmm. Um, So you've got the family package and then you do need to diagnose the business and understand What is it that we're looking at? What is the value? Is it a financial proposition? Is it a lifestyle proposition? Is it a risk thing that we're dealing with here? And really trying to figure out how the younger generation's needs and wants, they're going to be different than the existing owner generation likely. And and giving the time for that is, like Perry said, it takes a while. You know, get comfortable at that kitchen table. You're going to have a handful of meetings there, but it's important. Yeah, there was also a question I think came out about, uh, they call it transitioning and out of the family, i.e. to somebody unrelated. So that's mm-hmm. going to take the similar types of dialogue. Well, uh, just like yeah. that, that story that I told about the, you know, the young couple that lived across the, the, the road from uh, the existing operator, right? That's, that's exactly the scenario you're talking about, eh, Randall. And uh you know, that, that, that transition loan I was talking about, that doesn't need to be within the family either, right? Yeah. You were also yeah. telling me um, some examples about, you know, who do you finance? And, and, and um, you know, there are people working in the realm of large commodity-based farming, and there's also mm-hmm. other people who've found their niche. And uh, you were mm-hmm. telling me that there, there's some really interesting stories there as well. So, you know, I want to make sure people don't come away with, you have to be super large. What it is no. you have to be focused on whatever it is you're doing, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, we have loans, we have something called starter loans that start at $50,000 as well too, right? So I mean, we're, we're trying to, we're, uh, to, to serve the whole spectrum of all sectors within the industry. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll add a note there to just, to you know, the reminder that it's not always about scale. Um, Perry, you may know this or you'll get familiar. One of the biggest challenges with financing maple equipment is you ask producers, how many days a year do you actually use your evaporator? And I want you to think about that. You're making an investment in a piece of equipment that often gets used for 14, 16 days, 18, 20 mm-hmm. days a year max. So there's a dilemma there with capital um, utilization However, I think the opportunity there, especially for the smaller scale enterprises, is to realize you have 18 days of intense harvest season. That gives you 300 plus days of the year to have other income generating activity. And we see that in Vermont. We see a huge economic development opportunity to say maple doesn't need to be a full time business. This doesn't need to be a dairy farm mindset. Milk and cows, 365 days a year. You can have a successful and profitable part-time maple enterprise that will need to be complemented by other business or income generating professions. And, and it's possible. And we see that. We see contractors, independent business owners, insurance agents that can take three weeks off for the harvest season and do their woods management in the evenings because they enjoy being outside. So mm-hmm. it's just important to understand what you're expecting out of your business to understand where the business needs to how it can develop. I've heard some executive directors do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, John, that's I, right. <laughs> are there some more questions that people who are on, well, I was going to say online, but I guess we're on video here, would like to take off the video and uh, take off the mute and, and ask a question of either of the two speakers here. A uh, question for Mark. Uh, Mark, you mentioned about the younger generations uh, that have different uh, point of views than current. Uh, what specifically motivation, maybe one, two or three, that 
uh, if I would be looking at uh, uh, looking at younger generations and saying, uh, here's why you want to, you know, what, what, what are specific that what they look that is different than yeah. the 63 year old guy for maple yeah. syrup production only. Yeah, yeah. So Mark, um, if you have any insights from what you're doing, but uh, Perry may also have some insights and I'm opening it up to him as well after the sure. speech to say yeah. what are the other farm organizations doing to try to attract a, a, a newer, a new crowd into the business, a new group that may or may not be family connected or maple syrup connected. So Mark? Yeah, well, yeah, and I think that's important that I, I think a general, let's start with the generation, the senior generation. Let's not assume that your children want to or, or, or are well suited to take over an agricultural venture. They may not be. So the idea of expanding that mindset to say, this doesn't need to be a family legacy. This could be a, a stewardship legacy for the forest. And we may need to find someone outside the family and, you know, feeling comfortable testing that conversation. Uh, but the younger generation to the question. Um, the younger generation may come into this with a different set of, um, maybe they have college loans. They're in a different generation. Um, maybe, you know, healthcare costs now and just kind of their livelihood is in a different framework than someone that's older may be experiencing. In, in the U.S., the reality is we have people on Social Security. Maybe they're quasi-retired running a Maple Enterprise. And think about the financial needs of a 20-year-old with no children. Well, that's one thing. But a 30-year-old starting to build a family maybe has a different financial situation. So I think that's kind of one thing to consider is just where they're at in their financial kind of trajectory. Um, and um, I guess I'll stop there. Perry, maybe you have some ideas of how the younger generation. Well, yeah. I mean, There's so, so many. I mean, I mean if, I, if I think about other sectors and how the sectors are taking a leadership role to to attract younger uh, producers in the business, you know, I, I can think about uh, some of the supply managed sectors are, are have have uh, have programs whereby they are that, for instance, they rent quota for a period of time, more or less. And uh, so that enables them to get into the to, into the uh, in, into that sector slowly and, 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 and it uh, reduces some of the barriers, financial barriers to entry. Uh, of course, there's loan programs out there as well. And then, but another thing I think about what can, it'd be interesting to hear, I'm sure there's some young folks on the call here tonight about what it was that attracted them to the business. And uh, when, I, when I talk about, I get, I'll go back to that young couple again. Hey, they're, they're excited about what they're doing there. They're entrepreneurial. They're running a, they're selling a niche product. They're, uh, you know, they have a, 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 a on-farm more or less agritourism business going as well. That's, that sounds to me kind of fun and exciting and, and, and engaging. So perhaps just this, I'm throwing ideas out there too. The industry needs to, to, to pr promote more of that there. Uh, I guess excitement around it too, and I think that's that's where you're going with your strategy. Those are a few thoughts. You know, I'm going back to Mark for a second. Mark, um, you know, you you work in extension as well uh, on the business side of it, and you 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 work quite closely. You and uh, Mark Iselhart work quite closely with the Vermont Sugar Makers Association. What is the Vermont Sugar Makers Association doing to try to attract uh, folks to to the sector? Well, that's a that's a great question. I I I'm I'm sitting here thinking maybe not enough. Um, we have the same age demographics that the dynamic that that Perry spoke of as well. We we have an aging maple population. Um, I think in our competitive maple regions, um, the businesses are big enough and exciting enough and innovating enough where there's a younger generation that seems to kind of naturally move in. Um, but I don't think it's widespread. I think we're gonna. I think we're facing the same issues of not only just recruiting that younger generation, but looking at some of the issues of capital and startup investment. And and um, I don't think we've got it figured out. And I don't know that there's actually an active an active program. The big fear we've got. We look at the maple production growth curve in the U.S. And I, I am aware that we could be facing a workforce development issue five, six years, ten years down the road. The number of taps are quickly exceeding what family and friends and, and business owners can do to manage it. And so I, I think that's looming for us, Randall, both family related and just kind of workforce development 
you know, preparing the sector for the growth that we're experiencing. Uh, it's on our minds. It's on our minds more than we have answers for, I think. It may be another opportunity for us all to work together since we're facing the same issues and uh, yeah. and, and do what um, Perry has said is that creative process comes around uh, uh, eventually and, um, and figure it out together. So uh, it's also one of the reasons why the working groups we established looked at that uh, applied uh, research and training, and we know that's required for new generation, and also why we're, we're looking at a fair number of other things in our working groups because we are anticipating these types of shortages of labor, uh, capital, new business relationships, new land tenure, i.e. how can you access crown land? How can you access conservation land? How can you work with First Nations on their uh, First Nations lands, et cetera? So um, the, these things have been lurking around for a while. We're taking a bit of a deeper dive on them. And we're looking forward to working with uh, Vermont and we're looking forward for working with the uh, Farm Credit Corporation. I think we all have the same uh, general objectives in mind um, from our each own perspective, but the objectives are similar. Well, okay. Randall, are we ready to call it an evening? We are. It's just hitting nine o'clock here. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark and, and Perry, for your presentations. We look forward to working with both of you in the future. And we do have summer tours and things like that coming up. So we now have uh, two additional speakers that could potentially fit into a summer tour and conference at some point along the way. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Good to be with you. Thanks, thank guys. You. Yeah. Thank you all yeah, and yeah. one and all for being on the uh, uh, listening in this evening or viewing this evening. Frank wants to say a final word. Oh, I mean, you've done it all, Randall. You thank them all. Thank you very much, Mark, Perry. Perry, I just read your article in the uh, Ontario Farmer magazine here. So it's just uh, quite a coincidence. I got to read that article. Plus then at the same time, uh, uh, Randall tell me you're going to be a guest speaker. So um, you probably, I hope you remember that article. You almost look like you've forgotten it. But no, <laughs> anyways, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, was, it was a great, it was a great article. And uh, uh, anyways, again, thanks a lot. Thanks for everybody that was on here tonight uh, for attending it. We were we hit a hundred uh, uh, participants tonight. A lot of good questions came out tonight, and um, I think uh, if you have any more questions, you can forward them to John, and he can send them to the proper parties, and uh, they can get back to you or whatever. A lot of information out there, and I wish everybody success. And the other thing is, happy sugaring this spring. Take care. <laughs> good night. Yeah, I want to leave you with the last one, but uh, Mark has just provided to everyone the answers to the chat questions. So look yeah, there. what I'm going to do, Randall and maybe John, I, I answered them on a separate sheet of paper. I'm going to, can I send, can I just send that sheet to you and you could, can you share it with the participants? Do you have a list of people you could email yeah. that to? Okay. Yeah, I think I can do that. Yeah. Thank, okay. thank you one and all. Goodbye. Take care. Thank Good you guys. Night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night. Bye. Yeah, Mark, nice to meet you. Yeah, Perry, you too. Great, great job. I look yeah. forward to crossing paths. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye now.